Uh, jumping into a new subject called Battlestar Galactica. Can you start, talk about the history in terms of how you got that thing off the ground um, way, you know, back in the early 2000s, how it all came together? Yeah, I got a call from uh, David Icke, who was a, uh, pro he used to be a studio a network executive who had become a producer on the Universal lot, and I had known him from another project. David Icke called me in, I think, January or February 2002 and said, hey, um, I've got this deal at Universal, and they're looking for somebody to come in with a new take on Battlestar Galactica. Are you interested? And I said, huh, maybe, let me think about it. You know, I, I was in space for a long time, and I'd gotten out of space, and I didn't know if I wanted to go back into it. Uh, but I hadn't watched it in a very long time. So I tracked down the pilot at Blockbuster and rented it on VHS and uh, watched it over a weekend. And that viewing kind of, I had an epiphany, because that was just a couple of months after the 9-11 attacks. And so I'm watching the original Battlestar in that context. And I realized immediately that if you redid that show at that moment in time, it would have a whole different resonance for the audience. You know, the idea of an apocalyptic attack from your enemies and, you know, destroying the human race. And then it's about the survivors who are running away and pursued by their by their enemies into the night. That's a completely different show than it was in 1978. And it was an opportunity to really comment on the time that we were in and talk about things that were current in American and society and in the world of freedom versus security and the nature of terrorism and all kinds of stuff. And I just got excited by it and this called him on Monday and said, OK, yeah, let's do it. I, I think there's some there's really something cool here that we could do. Uh, that show. Um, I remember watching it as it aired, and it had so much buzz around it, and it was uh, it was in the cultural zeitgeist for you know as it was going um, with some it was a, a really big thing. Um, can you sort of talk about what it was like making that show with the buzz around it and you know the critical acclaim and you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it was interesting because we got I think that the critical acclaim came first. You know, the the ratings were uh, the ratings in the miniseries were very good and they were good enough to get us going to series. But then the ratings were sort of for Sci-Fi Channel's you know, metrics at the time and we were kind of on the bubble all season one. But there was started to become this buzz and, and the critics especially were really supportive of the show and there came this buzz that was getting around the show and we started getting awards and we were on the FI list and we won the, the Peabody Award and it was like we got all this sort of acclaim. And but the ratings were OK, like Sci Fi Channel always made us sweat every pickup like they might cancel the show or they, you know, they're going to cut it. They're going to pick up the show, but they're going to cut our budgets. You know, it was that kind of conversation. So we always were sort of fighting the sense of we could be canceled at any moment. But we really believe we're like true believers in what we're doing here. And, and again, like Deep Space Nine, we were like, one day they'll love us. One day this will be that special show that they'll all talk about. But but right then. It was hard to feel it, you know. Uh, you did start to see it grow over the course of the series. You know, the first, our first Comic Con that I went to with the cast before the show had actually broadcast, uh, there was a lot of skepticism in the room. There wasn't a full house by any means. We went out onto the floor of Comic Con to sign autographs, me and a, just like three or four of the cast members. And people kind of came up and they were like, you're redoing Battlestar Galactica? Why? And we were like, yeah, it's okay. You're, it's going to be cool. You're going to trust me. They're like, some people just took the signature and didn't even know why they were taking the signature. The second year, suddenly the, it was a packed house. And then, then the th third year, the, we had to get a bigger room, and it was like mayhem and craziness, and we were rock stars. And it was like you just literally saw it take off over the course of those those three Comic Cons. So it was, and you really had the sense of something special by then. And by the time the show ended, the network had changed its tune. Even though the ratings were still never spectacular by their lights, they were like starting to regret that we were ending the show and they were putting they were I would go into the executives offices and they were hanging up the awards that the show won in their offices when they used to just like say ah nobody cares about those awards or the ratings aren't the ratings aren't that good that's not really what matters uh it's so funny because Battlestar when you went to Comic-Con that was before Comic-Con had really transitioned into you know now it's the Comic-Con everyone knows but back then a show could be in one of those small rooms you know, uh, and it was, you know, I remember I'm going to I'm going to date myself, but I remember the first time that Smallville went to Comic-Con and, you know, it had like nobody. It was, yeah. you know, in a small little room that held maybe 200 people. 
you know, it, and uh, it, it was different. It was still a large gathering, but you're right. The culture of it was very different. I remember the moment I thought the Comic Con changed was when I walked down the floor one year and there was a booth for the office. And I was like, the office? That has no, there's nothing genre about the office at all. It's a fantastic show. But the moment that it was like, oh, this is all going to change because they've all woke up to the fact that this is a huge marketing opportunity right here. And sure enough, from that point forward, it was just like all bets are off. It was just like everybody was sorry going to Comic-Con. Completely. What was it like in the writer's room and making the show? Because as you mentioned with sci-fi, I mean, you you were making the show and this is going to be an understate, I mean, a sarcastic thing, but you were making it for five dollars and a roll of duct tape an episode, you know? Sure. You, you, you didn't exactly have these crazy budgets to make that show. So I'm curious, what is it like writing when you know the limit, you have limitations with the budget, and even though you have these lofty ideas and this big storytelling you want to do, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of trapped by that budget. Well, fortunately, going into it, I kind of knew that was going to be the case. So I sort of set up the mini series as an excuse to build all the standing sets that we were going to need for the show. So we pretty much built most, if not all, the Galactica for the mini series. So now we had standing sets. And then I told the writers from the beginning that it was really a character story. That was it was about the characters. It's about the characters. It's about the characters. And because it's about the characters, you could just do scenes of them talking in rooms. And that's really what the lifeblood of the show was going to be. It was going to be about them as people. And then we could kind of pick our battles of when we were going to go outside and when we were going to have space battles and how many other ships we could see and, you know, what the locations were going to be. But that the bread and butter of the show was Adama and Ty walking down a corridor and having a conversation or Starbuck and Apollo, you know, in a conflict on the hangar deck on our standing set. So. We really we felt the pinch and there were definitely times when we were cursing the, the, our lack of budget. But the show was designed in part to take advantage of the fact that I wanted it to be a character piece first and foremost. And that's mostly just people talking. When when did you I'm curious about like the the ultimate arc of the series. Did you know early on where you all where you wanted it to go? Did you always know you wanted it to be a certain amount of seasons or how much was it you you know, you pitched that idea and then it was figuring it out as you were going. I was adamant on, we're just gonna figure it out along the way. I said, you know, at the beginning, I, I could think about 10 episodes ahead was my metric. And in 10 episodes, I wanna be here. All right, now let's, let's uh, arc those out. Then we'd catch up and go, okay, what in 10 more episodes, we're gonna be over here. And then we'd arc that out. But I, I had no preset idea about how many seasons it would be, whether they would find Earth, what Earth meant, what the finale was gonna be. I just wanted it to be a very organic thing and improvisational. And you know, I think the show thrived on that kind of an improvisational quality because there were notions I had about the show at the beginning that ultimately proved not to be that great. And that we found better ideas along the way and the characters evolved along the way and the story evolved along the way. And a lot of things would not have happened if we had had like a preset locked and you know written in stone kind of idea of what the series was. Now, you know, that, there's a downside to that too. You improvisationally is fine, but at a certain point you've created so much web of mythology that you have to knit it all back together and it all has to make sense sense and that becomes a challenge you're like, oh shit now we've got all these plot threads that we've thrown up and we do have to find ways to knit them back together and make something coherent going forward but at that time i thought that was a trade-off worth making and it still felt to this day i know that the, some of the best things that came out of the show were there because we were willing to just change our minds and we were willing to just throw things out and pull something else in and always look for the best idea in the room regardless of where we thought we were going let's go here instead because that sounds that sounds better when you finally realized uh, it's gonna end, I believe you guys did like a three-part series finale. Um, what, how, sort of talk about crafting that finale. I thought it was like, I love the, the series finale, the last episode. Um, and I'm just curious how it all came together in terms of, you know what I mean? Like, where did the idea come from? And also, was it ever almost something else? Well, it was. I mean, uh, leading up into the final season, we took a, a writer's retreat for, for about a week and all the writers went to Lake Tahoe and we, we ran some cabins and stuck stayed with each other. And we just brainstormed what the final year was going to be. And out of that process came generally probably the first half of the season. And then we had a whole separate second half of the season. 
And what developed is, as, again, as we went and started writing those initial scripts and started working out the character arcs and the stories, we started to realize that, that the second half of the season wasn't lining up as well. We had changed a lot of things and it didn't feel as satisfying. So we had to go back. We went in back in a couple of times just in terms of what the destination was, where we were generally trying to go by the end. But we didn't actually break the final the final episode until relatively late in the season. So we had a guidepost of sort of where we wanted that to be and generally what was going to happen in the finale. But we didn't really break it in detail until it was time to write it. And then it was um, sitting in the room like traditionally and trying to figure it all out. And it became the first couple of sessions were very frustrating and we all got frustrated because it was, it was just so much plot and there was so much action and it was just like trying to do it, wrap up all these war stories and do this big war thing. And I went home one night and in the shower, I just had this epiphany and I came back in the next day and raced the board and just wrote, it's the characters stupid on it. And we all laughed and it was, let's just talk about the characters and let's just talk about each of our characters and what we want to do with them in the finale. And I wrote, I mean, one of the first images I had was somebody has a broom chasing a, a bird around inside of a house. And I don't know what it means, and I don't know who that is, but let's put that up. We put that up on a card and smacked it on the board, and we just started building these pieces of character moments. And then we started figuring out who the character, which characters we were going to visit, and then we started talking about seeing parts of their backstory that we had never seen and feathering that into a big wrap up and a big love letter to the show and who the characters were and who they had been and how they had become the people that we knew seemed like uh, a, a very uh, that that would be a great idea for the for, for the final episode. And that's how the final episode kind of ultimately took its shape. I believe when it aired, the three parts were like 141 minutes. There's an extended cut that was 152. And I've read that the original uncut was like four hours or something crazy. Am that's, I wrong about this? That's probably true. I mean, you have to remember, it was never, it was going to be originally a two hour and it was written as a two hour, but the page count and then the amount of time that was shoot, once we started putting the footage together, it was clear it was never going to fit in a two hour time slot. So then you started talking about well, how do we do that? There's no such thing. It's not really a three-hour movie that's too big, especially for Sci-Fi Channel. It's asking too much of the audience with commercials. And so it became, well, how do we divide this up? Maybe it's a three-parter. So it became just sort of, what do we do with all the foot? How do we make this coherent? And then they went for, okay, what we'll, we'll do as a three-part uh, broadcast. There, uh, the original cut probably was closer to four hours. There was a different structure in the script than what ended up on screen. The structure in the script was much less linear. It was very non-linear. I was doing flashbacks and current stuff, mixing up the flashbacks. You know, you would see the end of of Laura's story before you saw the beginning of it, and then you would come back to the present. Then you'd see another piece of Adama's story, and it was really like very challenging when you read it. It was like, wow, it was really a, a huge thing to wrap your mind around. It was very, very cool, and everyone got really excited about it. When you laid it out like that in film, it was really hard to follow. And as much as I wanted it to, to work, I kind of people were around me were going, I don't know, I'm not sure it works. Maybe you should make it linear. And then I started feeling, okay, maybe you're right. So it just became a more linear piece in that all the flashbacks lined up one, two, three, four, five, you know, chronologically instead of doing all the flashbacks out of order. So once you did that, it changed the fundamental structure of the entire and then some of it just there were some scenes that work some scenes going too long so that's what the difference between the four hour and the three hour was it was really just kind of changing the structure tightening up and making the usual cut, cuts and edits you do on almost any piece of film to just get it down to its to its fighting weight um have you ever shown the uncut version has it have fans ever seen it have you ever just talked about showing it at like comic-con as like you know the uncut series finale uh, I have not, and uh, I have frankly haven't seen it myself since that initial viewing. I mean, um, I probably have it on on a burned on a DVD someplace somehow. I'm sh I'm sure if I asked Universal where their their masters are, they'd say, "Oh yeah, we have them all the masters in you know a salt mine somewhere," and then they'd never be able to find them. Uh, but it's you know it exists. It was put together that way, and you know it'd be fun to watch it again. I don't know. You know, there's also a version of the. The miniseries that was never seen too that was much longer and you know had but a lot of times longer is not better 
is one of the tricks, you know. We're used, to, I'm used to watching original director's cuts and early cuts of episodes and movies, and they're always long. But that doesn't mean that they're better. They just have more stuff. And some of that stuff just needs to go because it's it's not working, the joke's not playing, it's, it's unnecessary, it's repetitive. So a lot of the editing of these things is really to its betterment. But that said, I wouldn't mind. I mean, it'd be kind of a coup to, to find the original cut and take a look at it. Well, what I'm curious about is, so you have that four hour cut of it. How much in that cut do you think was unfinished? Like, is it one of these things where like you could actually watch it and enjoy it? Or are you gonna see a lot of storyboards or some green screen? Do you know what I mean? Oh, you would see, you wouldn't see storyboards. You would probably see a lot of green screen and you would see um, in terms of the, uh, like the, uh, Vipers and Battlestar fighting stuff. There might be temporary shots. There could be previs shots, which, which are kind of grayscale models. Uh, there could be missing shots. You know, just cards that say what's going to happen in this shot. It would be really rough. You know, very rough stuff. It, it wouldn't. It's not. Wouldn't be close to you know a, a finished product. 